<laughs> well, um, Stacy and I, um, well, we thank you both for having us here. And this is going to be a really casual conversation today. So hopefully you guys will feel comfortable about just jumping in and um, following up on any answers to the questions that were asked. And we had a lot of online survey questions that we compiled. And so we were gonna go ahead and start with those. And then if you wanna follow up as we're answering those or however this works is totally fine. Or if you want to just hold off and then we can have uh, your chat questions after, but we'll just start off with going through some of those um, questions we've already received. And then, the, but the first part is Stacy and I will introduce ourselves and then we'll kind of ping pong back and forth with the questions that we received and then we'll answer them. And so again, very casual. I want you guys all to feel super open about just, you know, stopping us in our tracks and just asking questions as we go too. So um, I think that was it. Oh, the one thing, the questions from the survey we compiled, basically they're gonna cover all the questions you all asked. But if they don't exactly sound like your questions, it's because we lumped some of them together that were very similar. So um, hopefully we're covering the grounds of what you've already asked and then we can follow up with some more questions. So we're just gonna go ahead and introduce ourselves and then start off with the questions that we got um, from the survey. And then again, jump in when you want. So Stacy, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Stacy Archfield. I work for the US Geological Survey. Um, and I've worked there for 22 years now. I had a non-traditional path, I would say, to the career that I have now. I started at the USGS as an undergraduate um, and worked there through my undergraduate, uh, finishing my undergraduate degree and then through my master's and my PhD. I started as a field technician there, so I mostly went into the field and collected data. Um, I actually helped Kamini. I was a field assistant for a few days with her um, while she was doing her PhD research at a USGS field site. Um, and uh, then I worked uh, into more interpretive studies, then I into project management, eventually into doing more research type activities, and then into where my research career is now as a research hydrologist for the USGS. I spent 15 of those 22 years in a local office in the USGS. So the USGS has an office in every state in the United States. And so I spent my time in Massachusetts and then um, in the last seven years was uh, asked to transfer to our headquarters, which is located just outside of Washington, DC, where I've um, been doing research there. When I was in the local office, that was more of what you might call a soft money position. We, 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 you wouldn't get fired if you couldn't find um, projects that covered your salary, but you would be asked to do, um, I would say like less desirable tasks. You wouldn't have a lot of freedom to do the work you wanted to do. And so uh, the position I have now is more of a hard money position where um, I have more freedom to choose the things that I wanna work on. I mean, I don't have to worry about um, what project, uh, writing proposals and finding projects to, uh, to fund the work that I do. So, uh, so I, it's been a varied um, career, even though it's all been with the USGS. So that's my background. Heather, do you wanna talk a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so I started, I work with the US EPA and a lot of people think that that just equates to regulations and um, trying to do decision making. And actually there's a whole arm of EPA, some of you might know, not know about, it. it's called the Office of Research and Development. And that's the arm I work for. So basically what we do is a lot of supportive research for potential decision making. So similar to Stacy, we can kind of craft our own research. It's hard money. Um, so I don't have to go and, you know, hustle for uh, writing grant proposals or anything. I can't, you know, we can be on grant proposals, but we don't have to be. So um, we do a lot of creating our own research under certain frameworks that um, EPA wants at the time or certain um, pushes during different administrations. So, but I've been here for 13 years. My first part was as a postdoc. I got my postdoc in Syracuse at, um, in 2007. So um, I was in Athens, Georgia with the EPA, a lab there uh, for three and a half years. And then I am now in Cincinnati, Ohio. We have a really large uh, lab here. Well, I call it a lab, but it, there's a multiple national research centers here. So there's about a thousand people in our building. Um, 
it's across from the University of Cincinnati, which is kind of nice too. But so, uh, yeah, my background uh, before that, though, I did similar, um, I have kind of that security, anyhow, a, a loopy past as well. So um, I, I worked for environmental consulting for a while, an engineering company after I got my master's degree. Um, I also worked for an art publishing company and then I worked for an NGO. So there was a lot that went on before I went back to get my PhD. So I'm mentioning this because some of you may be master's students or maybe even bachelor's students who might think, oh, I need to just you know hop right in, get my PhD right away. And similar to both of us, we, you don't necessarily have to do that. So that's kind of why I mentioned that too. So I think that's good enough from my background and we can just start into some of the questions because we only have 45 minutes. So- um, <laughs> Could I ask a really uh, yeah. just a clarification really quickly? Just because the, you use the term hard money. I was wondering if you could just briefly mention the difference between hard money and soft money in case people haven't heard those terms before. Yeah, I will try. And then if I don't do this well, Stacy, you go ahead. But soft money basically means that you have to have a component of your job um, involves you have to write grant proposals and get money from external sources. Hard money means that there's kind of a, a line item or some some sort of stable support for your salary. Is that how you would describe it, Stacey? Yes, yeah, yeah. In the federal government, it's that Congress appropriates, right, money for you or in the university environment, like your salary is a line item in the university that every year is, is like you are supported and you're guaranteed that salary, right? And then or otherwise, like you have to go out and find that money from somewhere else, right? Yeah, so that's, yeah. So we're both very fortunate that way. <laughs> at this yeah. point in our careers. Yeah. yeah. So was that, is that it for those questions? And we can, okay. So um, I'll start off with the first question and Stacey will start into answering it and then we can kind of just, again, ping pong. But one of the first big picture um, questions that we got and by, from several people was just how does one find these types of non-academic research positions? What sort of skills, degree, um, degrees, and work experience do you need to get involved in this kind of career? Yeah, so I would say, so speaking from like the USGS perspective, but I think this is, uh, I would, so this is N equals one, right, on one data point. I think um, is that there's many different entry points I would see. Um, so for example, at the USGS, like the different uh, places I've been in my career, so there are, and they require different levels of skill. So there's like the the lab or field type jobs that are available, those typically require an undergraduate degree. Um, then there's, uh, I think, um, the more interpretive type work then moves on or research type work moves into having, I think, a master's or a PhD level type work. So I think it's really about what you want your data look like and what type of controls you want to have on your job. I think that um, maybe in the NGO world, Heather can probably speak to that when she gives her answer, like what the entry points are for those positions. I think at the USGS, one of the really interesting things about working there is that there are people, you do not need to have a PhD to be classified as a researcher at the USGS. There are people that as long as you are doing the job, uh, as long as you are doing research, there are very successful researchers at the USGS that do not have PhDs that are at the higher, that are at the highest GS levels and they do not have a PhD. Um, they're uh, so um, that's one thing I think that is interesting about government services that you're kind of uh, judged based on just the publications and things that you do and not necessarily your education level. So I'm a little bit optimistic in that way when it comes to, I think, more that there's uh, opportunities for entry levels in terms of the different education, I guess, as far as you want to go with your education and what you your day kind of wants to, I, I guess, what you want to do. I think there are entry points or the different education levels that you have. Sorry, I feel like I'm repeating myself a little bit there, but Heather, maybe I feel like you have a much more varied background. I just have the federal experience at USGS, but maybe from the NGO perspective, is that- Yeah, similar? so yeah, no, I'm glad you said that because, um, well, first, USGS is a little different than EPA, Office of Research and Development, because most everyone I work with has their PhDs. So if you're in the Office of Research and Development in particular, in the EPA, you typically would have your PhD to do research to be classified as a research scientist. So even within the federal realm, it's all a bit different. Mm -hmm. So, and then with the NGO or the non-governmental organization, 
re I didn't do research there per se. It was more, I did uh, watershed planning. So helping watershed groups in different regions develop their plans. It was the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. So it wasn't a global organization necessarily, but that uh, was a master's level kind of job. And then for the uh, environmental consulting or the environmental engineering company I worked for was a master's level and some positions required your PE and some did not. Mm -hmm. So it can vary. And I like how Stacy said there's multiple points of entry and it, it kind of is your decision too of how much control you want to have because over your day-to-day uh, -day life essentially right. <laughs> at your job because I think we can both testify to once you have your PhD you can make many of your more of your own decisions would you say that too about yeah and I would say and I would say that depends uh yeah sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes that's a bad thing I think it's really about like what you what yeah what you want your day-to-day -to, -day to look like right exactly yeah yeah so okay so part of i'm just making sure we covered all that how does one find these and the one thing i wanted to think of too is that i i start i said i started out as a postdoc and stacy you had started out as a, a you said undergraduate a, student yeah as a yeah. temporary employee oh yeah and i did want to say oh yeah i guess um i'm glad you said that because in terms of at least usgs and i think all federal careers the way that you would get involved there your entry point there is there's a website usajobs.gov that you can look at, at least for federal careers. Um, uh, you do need to be a US citizen to apply for, unfortunately, because that does, I say unfortunately, because there is talented people all over this planet. And so unfortunately it is limited to um, US citizens only um, for these positions, but you can find temporary positions as well as permanent positions posted there. If you do have your own funding through NSF or a fellowship, we also, you are also able to work at least at USGS um, we provide you an office, computing resources, and access um, as well uh, is another way that you can start engaging with USGS scientists that could lead to perhaps a position um, as another way to, at least as an entry point for USGS. Um, so I did want to mention that specifically as well to that question. In the past, we have sponsored visas, international visas. I don't know what that looks like now with the executive order, but I know in the past we have been able to do that. So, yeah. Okay, I guess we could go to the next one. I'm sure we'll okay. cover multiple ideas as we go through these. Yeah, and he so Heather, I'll ask you the next um, question for you. So uh, that we had uh, that came in. As an undergrad, um, how do you take steps towards setting yourself up to get one of these positions? What skills uh, should one be working on now to prepare for this type of position? What tips and insights could you provide uh, to students to get to get ready, such as building skills, networks, um, et cetera, before applying for a non-academic research career? Okay, so there's a lot in there. So um, hopefully Stacey and I together can cover this. Um, the one thing I wanted to drive home early and probably often, especially if you're in your undergrad or master's degree years, or even your early PhD years if in the US, because you do have to take courses, is take as much coding, um, physics, math, and engineering as you possibly can. Because what I've learned over my career is one, I wish someone would have told me that, <laughs> and two, that it's easier to learn other skills later than those skills. Those skills take so much more focus and, and dedication to learn and do that when you're getting your degrees. I would say that because there's some things, I mean, we all have to learn a little bit as and, and why you get your PhD is to learn, you know, through life. But I think some of those things are just, it's better to get it when you're in a structured atmosphere where you can just, you know, have that under your belt, water quality modeling, things like that, as much as you can. Um, so that's more of the practical kind of skills. There's one thing that I know I had done, and it may or may not be for some of you, but there is this book that's called What Color Is Your Parachute? And you may or may not have heard of it, but it is really cool if you're kind of a structured person who likes to go through, like, what do I really see myself doing on a day-to-day -day basis? What do I really like to do? So that you can find a, a career path that you really enjoy. And there's a lot of questions and options for um, just stepping yourself through, really thinking through that in that book that's super helpful. And if anyone needs a reminder of what that is, just follow up in the chat. Um, and also um, talking to your advisor and if you think you wanna to go to grad school, if you think, well, I can't do what I wanna do 
uh, with a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, talk to your advisor, especially if you're a first generation um, uh, college student or, or graduate student, because there are a lot of things like I know I personally didn't know, for example, because I, I mean, I'm not a first generation college student, but I am for, well, for getting my PhD. And I didn't know, for example, that if you're applying to graduate schools, you should talk to advisors in those schools and talk about what you're interested in, things like that, not just apply. You know, there's, there's all these little things. So just have some conversations with your advisor or just a trusted mentor or a trusted, you know, instructor or, or uh, faculty member. Um, that would be really helpful. So um, that's, those are kind of things I was thinking of. Stacy, did you have others? Yeah, I think, um... Heather, that's really, I didn't know that about you. I'm first generation undergrad and graduate too. So that, that was really knowing, yeah, that there's some kind, there are some like uh, relying on the value of your network. Like that was something that I really benefited from starting with the USGS as an undergrad and then being able to talk to other people who had been in the field, like to give me those tips. Like I didn't understand that, you know, you could get PhD programs where you were generally paid to go, like, you know, I didn't understand like how that even worked. So it was, uh, that's excellent advice. I think the other thing that really helped me was staying flexible early on in my career path. So like I started out as a field assistant, so I was pretty much doing anything they asked me to do. So, but that allowed me to work in like groundwater. I collected surface water data, water quality. I did lab stuff. So I started to really like, now that I work mostly behind a computer, I actually got exposure to how the data was collected. And I think that's something that I value now is like knowing actually where the data came from. So I think that like being flexible early on and ma making myself useful, I felt like I was so worried about not having a job later on that I tried, I just basically like tried to figure out ways to make myself useful. So I, t and I also tried to teach myself things that people were too, that I knew would be helpful, but that people were too busy to not be able to learn. So like new statistical methods or co coding language that I knew could be helpful, but someone I knew they were, you know, the PI was too swamped to, un to learn. And so I was like, I could do this. And I know this would really help if I automated this and I would just go off and do it. And that I was like, they can't fire me if I, if I like write this code, <laughs> like I'm useful then, you know? So, yeah. So I think those are, those are kind of like uh, examples of things I think that you also like hone in on, like uh, that you've honed in on too. So yeah. Uh, that's, uh, yeah. Super helpful. And, and there's actually um, a question too in the chat we can take too. There's um, are there specific coding languages that are standard in EPA? I've gotten pretty good with R and ArcGIS. Are there other programs that come to mind that I should look into? Um, R and ArcGIS are really good, at, uh, at least for the research that I do and my group does. Um, there's also Python, of course, but you know, R and Python can switch back and forth fairly easily. And then MATLAB. Um, MATLAB, but you know, that is, R and Python seem to be the going thing right now. Um, and Stacy, I know that's EPA, but I think, I think of not just EPA, but all my, um, all my collaborators too, and R and, uh, R seems to be the, where it's at. I would say R for their open source. I think all, yeah. uh, almost all USGS programs that are being served up are moving into R. Um, so almost all of the tools that are being developed are being moved into R even the more yeah. traditional programs we serve. Yeah, I, maybe Python, I think the groundwater community tends towards more Python, but I think R is pretty much where, um, where things are moving if they haven't already. Yeah, totally. So yeah, um, I think Mike, if you, um, if you know R and ArcGIS, I think you're in a good place if you dip your toe into Python and maybe a little bit of MATLAB just to have some you know, broader background, that's great too. But um, yeah. I know any of the postdocs that I work with, if they say they work with R and ArcGIS, I'm like, that's good. Let's just go with that. <laughs> so you're good. Um, okay. So what else? And again, feel free to do what Mike did there and just ask some questions as we go. Um, so also the next question is Stacy. What kinds of options slash, slash paths are there for students coming out of their undergrad who do not wish to go into academia? What grad school options are there for these situations? 
So we kind of yeah. talked about that a little bit. We did, yeah. And so I had uh, I had jotted down before the meeting like that. I would say that most of the people that I went to grad school and undergrad with, and maybe this is a function of the schools that I went to for grad school and undergrad, actually did not pursue a career in academia that they mostly went on to, um, I wrote, jotted down, like, so they mostly went on to either federal government, I would say teaching positions at high school or colleges in non-teaching roles. So they were teaching faculty. They didn't um, do, uh, they were, so they were in academia, but they chose not to be a, a tenure track faculty uh, member. They did industry consulting. Uh, some went on, I thought, to state Department of Environmental Protections or even large um, entities like uh, the Massachusetts Water Resources Association, which controls uh, the Boston Municipal Water Supply. So they would they went on. They, this was a water quality PhD student went, that I went to graduate school with. Went on to you know a large city municipal water supply. Um, uh, agency, um, or they did large watershed consortiums. This is more also a function of being in the Northeast United States, which is where I did my graduate work and my undergraduate work. Um, there's these really large watershed consortiums that are well funded. Um, and so a lot of the people that have PhDs and master's degrees that I knew went on to work for them because they actually are so well funded that they have watershed modelers, water quality modelers on staff they don't outsource that work. They actually hire them on staff to do the modeling and then advocate using their models um, to legislators. And, and um, so I thought those were, so I, I got to see, it was actually kind of cool. It was not the automatic choice. I think only maybe one per two people that I went to graduate school with went into academia out of maybe the 15 or so that graduated with me in the civil engineering department. So, um, Yes, yeah, so I would say that was it was not the norm to go into academia. This was in two thousand and nine. So granted, it's it was eleven years ago. Maybe it's different now, but but yeah. So, so I, Heather, say, I don't know if you yeah if you have yeah questions. no same year. I mean, at least for my PhD, a lot of yeah most people went into um, a lot of federal government research. The Forest Service. Um, well, there's two in the Forest Service. There's um, Fish and Wildlife Service, um, EPA, USGS. So. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to even, I'm rocking my, well, there's a couple I can think of that went in academia, but <clears throat> the other thing is this is um, for undergrads too, um, consulting companies are a big thing and they can, they can run the gamut. They can, I mean, it depends on what your, um, how should I say this? I guess philosoph philosophical underpinnings are, you know, how, what, how you see life and things, but there are really good companies out there too. If you feel like, oh, I don't want to work for a consulting company, there are some really good ones that really care about getting the best environmental information to help companies that are trying to make, you know, get permits for different um, projects and things like that. So there are good ones out there. And then there's, of course, nonprofits, but there's a little bit of a trade off sometimes with your income or your salary with nonprofits. I mean, that's kind of known, but it, it does play out that way. <laughs> so, I mean, there's th things to think about there. And the other thing is if you, did want, who do not want to wish to go into academia, but you want to go to grad school, um, don't worry so much about what your degree is in now. So if you're an undergrad, say, I learned over time that there's so many people that I, I know that say got an undergrad, I mean, the, the most extreme was I heard someone got an undergrad in art design, arts, what is that, graphic design, and then went into civil engineering in their you know, master's and PhD, but it can happen, you know, it just depends on how hard you want to work at that. So there's just some oh. things, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was gonna, I have a, I can top you, I think. I have a, <laughs> a colleague of mine at USGS who got an undergrad in music, specifically studying the flute, music performance. Oh. And she is now <laughs> working for the USGS as a hydrologist yeah, and with a master's degree. She started a PhD, but decided it was, yes. Yeah, so it's like, yeah. it doesn't, matter yeah right so, right you can learn as you go for sure yeah. Yeah. i mean even though take as many courses as you can that are in math and you know physics and science yeah. but um there are some more um well i actually have one on my end too if i could throw it in just in case oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It came to me. um it was about applying for usgs jobs in specific so maybe stacy would be the right person to answer this one um while applying for usgs jobs one is supposed to respond to one or two sets of questions that mostly focus on experience with USGS instruments or measurement methods. 
Um, but coming from you know, a university, for instance, it might not be likely to have experience with those methods or instruments. Um, is this a negative point? Um, you know, this makes my applications maybe not suitable to the hiring manager. You know, what would some suggestions be for that? Yep. So I assume they mean, um, hopefully they'll shoot you a yes if when I say this and it resonates and they can be more than happy to email me privately too if they want to do this. But um, there's a specific set of questions that are pre-selected where you have to rate yourself from a one to five when you're applying to the federal government as to like, I have no experience with this particular instrument or this particular whatever the sentence is, and then a five is like, yes, I am comfortable. I use this every day, this instrument or this model. And um, so what happens with that is, and this is a general thing when you're applying on USA jobs, is that there's like a, it's a mathematical game. So the lower you rate yourself, you don't make it into the top candidate pool, which means the selecting official will never even see your application. So you won't even be given a chance at an interview. So unfortunately, um, the best candidates like sometimes don't even make it. So for example, I could be hiring a postdoc, which has happened in the past. And um, I know they're one of a highly qualified person. The selection thing goes out and they, I don't, and I'm like, did you apply? And they tell me yes. And I don't see them in the final list of candidates. And it's because they were, uh, we tend to always be more critical of ourselves, right? Than we actually are. And Therefore, they didn't make the final list. So I would say for people applying to those jobs, the advice that we always give is um, be as um, uh, kind to yourself as possible, knowing that that's how the system works. So if this is an instrument that, okay, maybe you haven't worked with this particular conductivity probe, I'm just throwing out an example, but you have worked with other conductivity probes, you've troubleshooted them, I would rate yourself very highly. I, I would do something along those lines. So, you know, be as honest as you can, but like, but I would also be generous with yourself too. That you will, you will have an interview and it will become apparent in the interview, you know, whether your skills are translatable or not, but you really want to get your foot in the door, I think um, is how I would answer that. I hope that helps. The person can email me privately if they want to talk more about a specific job announcement and how to handle that. Okay. Uh, actually, there's there's a couple, there were a couple more chat. Do you, I'm not sure if we're all catching those, but um, oh, it says, God. are there Python R slash coding workshops that are offered? I guess that means like um, within the organization. I mean, most of ours, we have a pretty good training budget. So if you see something externally, you know, we're, we can just go do it. So that's especially for postdocs, but also for all levels. So but I know USGS is a little different. Sometimes you guys have actual internal training courses too. We do. Um, USGS does offer a range of training courses internal to USGS and then external uh, people can, once US, it's offered to USGS, if there are open spaces, then other federal people can join. And then after that, it's opened up, I think, more broadly. Um, I think with our R training courses, there's some introductory free courses um, that people, we encourage people to take online and then um, we do have our own internal courses. Uh, if people are, in, I teach like, for example, the USGS statistics course and that is uh, complemented by R. We use R when we teach the USGS stats course. So um, yeah, so we do have training offered to employees as well. So if you are hired and you wanna learn more, you can, you have access to those training courses. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. So yeah, that's good. And then it says, <laughs> this is a, this is a tricky one at this point in time, but I'm going to, let's go with it. So are non-academic research jobs in the USA off the table for non-US citizens? Are there any non-government jobs that may be available to international people? Um, okay. Things just got trickier this week, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. um, unfortunately. So when it's I can just speak to, I have a really, um, a colleague who is, uh, has an insanely good skill set in a topic that is of critical importance right now uh, to the United States and very few people are being trained right now on this topic and, uh, and uh, does not have US citizenship. And so I've had to work with them quite a bit and I know that they did find employment with um, like a reinsurance company because they work on hazards. And so I know there are companies that with you know, with skill sets that are of importance, you know, I know that, again, I don't know with this, what the news from this week, but I do know that 
at least for that particular skill set, like re there are comp large companies, like re reinsurance companies, at least for this particular topic that, that they were able to find employment with and they sponsored their visa. So um, I, I, that's the one small, again, N equals one, like one data set, tiniest data set that I can um, offer that there are places willing to do that, at least one that I know of. Well, I think that's a good example because I think overall that's probably the direction to go is with for-profit companies or, or international and non-government organizations. Mm -hmm. um, at, this, at, this, at this point, um, I know because they can potentially sponsor visas. Um, I know right now in the federal government, it's um, especially for a lot of our more postdocs, you just can't not be a citizen or um, you just can't federal postdocs. And then we used to have programs, uh, there's the Oak Ridge Institute of Science and Education, National Research Council, where we could sponsor J-1 visas and have international students um, who are just graduated. And that is now um, not happening. But if you are just in your early stages of your graduate career, for example, things change with elections. They truly do. And we, I've, we've, I've been in EPA long enough where I've seen that. And so this may be a tough time right now to get into the federal government for non-citizens. But I think in general though, um, I, Stacey, I'm checking you on this, like for the federal government, you, you have to be a citizen. I mean, that's like kind of just a standard. Yeah, and unfortunately with this particular person, because their skill set was so important to the work that we do, I went down this path pretty far yeah. and it, it's definitely pretty firm that it's US citizenship yeah. for permanent employee and temporary employee. Yeah, for postdoc, yeah. Yeah, so. but companies companies and international nonprofits are a really good place right now because if they see your, you, they really want you, they will work to get your visa, so. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it for the chat. Um, and so was it my turn to ask? Yes, Heather, I think it's uh, my turn to ask uh, oh. you. So um, what kind of options and paths are there for students? Oh, I'm sorry, you asked me that one. What challenges, for, uh, what challenges are there for students with a strong academic background when applying for non-academic research careers? I think um, this was one I, I think I wasn't quite sure. And I, if someone is on who had asked that, maybe if I'm gonna talk slowly, if you wanted to clarify in the chat, maybe. Um, yeah, cause I don't know if you possibly meant that if you're overqualified, what do you do? But either way, um, if you're trying to say you have a strong academic career, but you're going for something you're either overqualified for or doesn't really fit the academic mode, um, there are so many skill sets you can play up in that other role that you might be applying for, problem solving, teamwork, uh, data analysis, writing, presenting. I mean, just always think of all those other skills you're getting while you get your master's or your PhD or even your undergrad. I mean, it's not just school. You're really learning life skill sets that can be applied to another job. If this is, uh, so maybe, uh, Stacey, you might have interpreted this question a different way. So I'm gonna see if you have, because. No, I saw it as an advantage if someone came in with a strong academic background and I would have seen it as an advantage. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, so I wouldn't have seen it as a disadvantage. Kamini, yeah. are you getting any feedback on the chat about this question or we can just move on to the next one? If Okay, does any, I don't know if anybody else, okay. How about we just move on then? Okay, so is there a good source that introduces non-academic opportunities in organizations that one can access? Yeah, so I thought about this one um, and I wasn't sure. So I don't know if this idea is a creative idea or one that maybe people have thought of before, but um, I had thought about, I couldn't think of one particular source, but I did think that uh, a good spot to look would be um, at the organization and companies that sponsor large professional meetings like AGU or GSA, ASCE, like um, ESA, Ecological Society of America and EGU as examples, because those are the places what, when we're in an environment where we can actually go to meetings and kind of wander the exhibition hall. These are places where you could interact with someone and ask, you know, what does your company do? 
what types of people do you hire? What, what are the backgrounds? You know, what's, you know, what's the angle? Like, what do your day to days look like? So I thought that maybe um, that might be, and you could even now in the COVID environment, you know, you could look at past meetings and see who some of the sponsors were for these meetings to try to do some research on some of these uh, companies as a place to start. Um, so that, that was kind of the thought I had about a place to figure out where we could find some ideas on that. Heather, did you have any other? Yeah, I didn't, honestly, I didn't have anything creatively on my own, but I did a quick Google search. I was like, so what did I find? Because I know personally, I didn't want to go out into academia. That was, I mean, I know it was about odd whenever you're getting a PhD, a lot of people, that's what they're aiming for. And I, I wanted to do applied research. So I remember doing a lot of research on that. And so I did a quick Google search and I saw that I did go back to Inside Higher Ed at that time, which was now 13 years ago, but there's some good art newer articles out like from 2018 that have about PhD, student, PhD students trying to find research jobs outside of academia. There was some on Mendeley.com, the Chronicle of Higher Education. So if even doing a quick Google search of research careers outside of academia, and you can find a lot of stuff now. There's a lot more information even than like 13 years ago. So, um, and then one of the good tips that I got early on, and I kind of stuck to, but I'm a very regimented person, is I, I read early on, like, look about eight to nine months out, start networking with people. And by networking, that could be um, your parents know somebody, or you have a friend whose parent knows somebody, or, you know, a faculty member that you know, something like that. Like, if they know somebody, just keep building that network and reach out by email. Tell them you're going to, you know, you'd love to talk to them for 15 minutes if they're in a consulting company or something like that, just to get a feel for what they do. And usually people are pretty responsive if you just give them that 15 minutes, all I want of your time, I just wanna to talk to you quickly and then follow through, set something up with them and, and start that networking. Um, and you'll get a feel for what people did because I actually did a lot of that. I, I interviewed with consulting, like for after my PhD, consulting companies, nonprofits and EPA and in that way, and before I even got the interviews, I was really just feeling out what direction to go. So networking is big. And, and by networking, it doesn't have to be like schmoozing necessarily in a large room. It can just be that email to reach out to that one person and start talking and get a name from that person and then contact that next person. You know, it's just, because I know networking can be very uh, overwhelming for, especially for introverts, <laughs> and I will readily admit I am one. Um, and so if you just do it in that, you know, piecemeal way, it might really be helpful, so. Um, okay, so I know we're- How many, do you have anything? Is there anything in the chat? I thought there's I saw you maybe- one. There's, there's a great one here, um, and it might be broader than just you too. So um, other people might wanna chime in on this one, but I, lo I love this question. It says, I'm a first generation undergraduate student in Canada, and I always feel so lost on even the basics of grad school. Even going to advisors sometimes confuses me because I don't know what to ask them. I just feel like I'm missing so much information and can't make informed choices for my future. Are there any books or resources that you could recommend that could, in quotes, teach me these things? And then sort of, again, in quotes, post-secondary education for dummies. So. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Stacey? Do you want to? Um, well, I would certainly offer to help. I'd be happy to talk with you. I think that that's like... Yeah. Um, one of the things I think that was most helpful to me was just getting a lot of different experiences, right? Like collecting data, like from different, you know, one person is probably not enough data. And I agree, like talking to advisors are not that helpful. And even talking to even just me as one person is not that helpful because I just have one path and one story. But I think that would help you gain like a more collective picture. Um, and I, I, yeah, so in terms of reading a book, I don't, yeah, that would be... I think expanding a network might be a uh, maybe a fruitful path in terms. So that might be a, a maybe a good way to do that. And that would also, as you talk to different people, you're also processing. It's not even just getting advice from them, but having to talk about your goals. And every time you talk to someone, you're talking about your goals. And so you're refining what you want your future to look like. You're refining what your future is going to look like what you want out of your future like it's that process I think will also be helpful to you like so so you also have to approach people that you're going to feel okay being vulnerable with and maybe part of why it's hard to go to your advisor is there's that vulnerability piece which I don't I I've 
got my PhD 10 years ago and it's still hard to be vulnerable with my advisor, right? So it's like not something that, so I would, I would um, maybe like, so I would, I'm just giving more arguments for maybe where like talking to um, people might be better than even reading, a, I think a book is good because you'll process in that way too, but I think ex talking to maybe more people about it that you feel vulnerable with, that you can feel vulnerable with, that you um, can also expand your network with would be good. And I, um, we can start that relationship. I don't expect you to feel vulnerable with me right away, but like, I'm very happy to do that or, or put you in touch with people or maybe your early career or, I, you know, we can, like Heather said, like, I can give you a name and maybe let, you know, we can start that chain of people. And that goes for anybody on this call, quite honestly. So um, that would be my advice, but that's also just what helped me. Maybe that's not um, what would be helpful to you too. So I qualify all of that which <laughs> also, so, yeah. I just, I just wanted to chime in as um, somebody who is in Canada and um, working with a lot of undergrad, great undergrads here. Um, and I, I think I can't speak for all Canadian universities, but I know University of Calgary is not very good at um, outlining paths from undergraduate careers to graduate programs, whether in Canada or outside of Canada. And I mean, so bad that, I mean, last, this was two or three years ago when I first got here and a student had applied to 14 programs in the US and never made a contact with a single person at any one of those programs. And they sort of assumed it was like undergrad, you know, you apply, you give your scores, you put your recommendations in, it's all good, you go. It, it's a very different process. And I think um, it, it, the onus is on us to make sure that that is a little bit clearer. And I'm happy to talk to people who are interested and, and, and in figuring out how to navigate that path, um, you know, both from a traditional perspective and a non-traditional perspective. So yeah, definitely reach out to rachel.lauer at UCalgary. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so great. Yeah. That's good. And I, I would say similarly, um, and I think this is a really important question that a lot of people don't feel comfortable asking because I even remember in my undergrad that I had a professor said you have the demeanor or the disposition to be go to grad school and I just kind of stared at him like I, I don't even know what that means like what do I do with that <laughs> so and basically I what I wish I would have done and I'm putting myself back in your shoes the person who asked this question is found that one faculty member maybe it's not even someone I had a course with but just go in and it's okay to like say just be vulnerable and just say listen, I don't know how to do this. Can you just give me a few tips? Like what's next? How do I don't even start applying? And you will find that they'll, they'll be helpful. I mean, because this is, this is the world of, of faculty, you know, grad school, universities, academia. So this is the one thing they really can help you with. Um, so feel like you can go and do that, definitely. So. Yeah, you won't be the first person that goes in and says <laughs> to a professor, I want to do this and I have no idea how to do it. Um, people come, my students come to me and say that stuff all the time. Even students I've never had in a course and never had in my lab will say, I want to do this. I don't know how to start. So don't be afraid to approach. I think it should be someone you feel like you can trust, but, um, and just to say, I don't know is, is great because that's what we're here for. <clears throat> So it looks like we have one minute. Um, I'll look at comedy and I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah there's one yeah. last quick thing you want to throw in. That's that's great. And then we'll break up for the um, the networking event. And if you two want to stay for that, that's awesome. We can put you in a room with some people that might be interested in talking with you too. I think I'm okay. I don't think I have any like burning, yearning things other than just uh, what we covered, which is great is I'm here for anyone. I, I'm sure, you know, please reach out. Um, I hope I get to meet you all in person someday, but please, uh, I hope you see me as a resource and a plus one to your network now. So 